All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training. Lord, may I hear and receive your word today. This morning again we go to the sixth chapter of Ephesians. I want to read again in your hearing our paragraph. Beginning at verse 14, down to verse 20. Stand therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. May God this morning truly add a blessing to the reading of his word. May we search diligently the scriptures, seek to understand what it is God is sharing with us today. Some of you may recall in your high school literature reading, reading the story of the uh, Parsian slave by the name of Spartacus who led a very successful uprising of slaves against Rome. The story was made into a movie quite some years ago. I remember the original movie that starred Kirk Douglas as he played the leading role. Spartacus, we're told in history, defeated the Roman army seven times before he himself was finally captured and defeated by the great Roman general Marcus Linius in 71 BC. Spartacus, we are told, started with a very small band of slaves and were being trained as gladiators. At first, little attention was given to Spartacus. Yet, with this smaller force, Spartacus was constantly able to defeat larger forces. Why? He learned a particular tactic. He learned to attack very late at night or early in the morning when the Roman army was not prepared to do battle. He would attack when the opposing force simply did not have on their armor. The same is true with us in our spiritual warfare. Certainly there is more power available to us than that which exists for our enemy because Jesus Christ is in us and scripture says, he is greater than Satan, who is in the world, according to 1 John 4 and 4. It is also clearly stated in James 4 and 7 that if we submit to God and resist the devil, he will flee from us. Yet our adversary and his forces are able many times to be victorious over us time and time again. Many fall back into sin. Why? 
because Satan, like Spartacus, seeks to attack us when we are most vulnerable. He attacks us when we don't have on the full armor of God. This morning, we come back to our study on spiritual warfare, to the armor of God that God has provided for us. I want us to carefully examine each piece of armor. I want us to see what it is for, the meaning of it, and how God wants us to use the pieces of armor so that we may stand firm against the schemes or the wiles or the strategies or the plans of the devil. We have read... Ephesians chapter 6, and we begin in verse 14. But verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, put on the full armor of God, that you may be able to stand firm against the scheme of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual force, forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. We have already examined to some extent the nature of the spiritual war because we are involved, all of us who are believers, we are involved in a spiritual battle. And this battle is against a very well organized and powerful adversary who is, according to scripture, a schemer, a planner, who seeks to exploit our every weakness. But from Scripture, our text in particular, we are called to be strong in the Lord. In order that we might stand firm against the devil's attack against us. One of the ways to stand firm, one of the ways to help us to remain upright is to understand some of the ways in which we will be attacked. However, understanding our enemy's method of attack will do us no good if we are not prepared to defend ourselves when the time comes. That's why we must have on the armor that God has provided so that we can stand firm against the enemy. Now, now Paul here, he's painting a picture. He's painting a picture here and he's using military symbolism to help us understand that we need to have on the armor of God and what we must do with the armor of God. This is what we call appropriate symbolism as he describes for us our warfare. The various pieces of armor that Paul mentions are those that were actually worn by the Roman foot soldier. In all likelihood, there was a soldier either chained to Paul or at least standing guard over Paul while he was writing our very text. Paul could simply look at each piece of equipment that the soldier had on and then use that piece of armor to illustrate what would be needed to be prepared for spiritual warfare. We notice that our text talks about, first of all, the belt, which ties and holds everything together. Then there was the breastplate that protects the vital organ, particularly the heart. Then he mentions the feet that have shoes that were specially designed to give good, firm footing so that the soldier would not slip and fall. 
Then there is the shield which is used to defend against the blows of the enemy. And we know that the head is critical for the rest of the body to be able to function. It is also to be protected by a helmet. And finally, he makes mention of the sword, which is to be used both as a defensive weapon as well as an offensive weapon to make our strikes against the enemy. If you're reading your Bible, please note again verse 13. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. Now this is the second time that he has said to put on our armor so that we can stand firm. Notice the stress to the statement for him repeating it two times already. The stress here is on being prepared. The armor is part of our preparation that will enable us to stand firm against our adversary. Not just to stand, but to stand firm against our adversary. The word translated here, to put on or to take up, is a general military term for taking up of your arms. In other words, they would say the battle is about to begin. Get ready, put on your armor. Don't get caught off guard as the Romans were when Spartacus would attack. They were only able to grab what was readily at hand. We have to make sure we have every piece of the armor on. He goes on to tell us in the text, the purpose of the armor is so that we may be able to stand against the enemy in the evil day. What day? What evil day? What he's talking about today, this present age, which Satan is active among men. It was back in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16 where Paul admonished us to redeem the time. Why? Because the days are evil. Until Jesus Christ returns to set up his millennial kingdom, we will be living in evil days, evil times. This is why Satan is also referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, the God of this age. It is also why the idea of man being able to bring about any type of utopia is ludicrous. Man cannot achieve that by political or religious means. Because as long as Satan is active among men, there is going to be conflict. There is going to be corruption. There is going to be chaos. That is the story of our history, our human history. Yet somehow sinful man continues to think that somehow he's going to bring about world peace and bring about prosperity. Such is the foolish thoughts of men. However, though we may suffer because of the evil in this world, we as believers do not have to be partakers of it. <coughs> We do not have to succumb to the attacks of our enemies. We do not have to fall prey to Satan's traps and stumble into sin. We can just take up the full armor of God and resist in the evil day. And having done everything, we can stand and stand firm. Yes, amen. Ephesians 6 and 14, Paul says once again, he uses that same phrase, stand firm therefore. This is the fourth time in five verses that he's called us to resist the devil and hold our ground. Stay up on your feet. The picture here is not so much that we are attacking as that we are being attacked. 
And our objective is to hold our position and not fall back to where we were before. And where was that? In sin. We are admonished not to give up any ground in our pursuit of righteousness. Why? Because Jesus died to break the bondage of sin in our lives. He died to cleanse you and I and make us holy. That we would have an eternal relationship with God our Father. Our salvation from hell, saints, is simply a side benefit of being saved from sin. Now, for the rest of our time this morning, I'm going to go back and look again at the first piece of equipment we mentioned, we talked about last week. I'm going to go back and we're going to focus on verse 14. Now, I want to tell you right away, we're going to be on verse 14 for several weeks. Okay. Several weeks. I'm going to milk this belt of truth as much as I possibly can. Paul tells us again in verse 14, to stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Last week we learned the foundations of uh, the Christian doctrine, and I, and I hope you have uh, refreshed your mind with some of those non-negotiables. We call this first piece of equipment a girdle or belt. Some call it a special kind of belt. It's called in scripture the belt of truth. Now, I want you to notice the outline that we have given you, they cover all of my points. But they may not cover it the way I say it. And the answers have already been supplied so that you don't have to miss what I'm saying to try to write it down. Now, of course, if you want to write additional notes, by all means, do that. And I want you to notice in the outline that I have included at the end a portion where my young people, my children who are hearing my message, you, the parent, can engage the child in what we have spoken about today. And also, you, the student of the Word of God, if you want to go a little bit deeper, I have given you almost a page and a half of questions regarding what we talked about to help lead you in a further study of what we mentioned today. The belt of truth. What was this belt for? Going back to the Roman soldier, foot soldier. You have to understand the kind of clothing that he would have worn. It was sort of a long gown or robe that was called a tunic. It was usually made out of a square piece of cloth with holes cut out for the head and the arms, and it would hang down straight in a, down from the, so, from the shoulders. Now this was great for most activities, but it would hinder the soldier if he had to move fast, if he had to be agile, if he had to move with quickness, lightness of speed and ease. So a belt was needed to hold the clothing up off the leg so that the person could move quickly. A belt with me, which many of our young people know nothing of today. <laughs> I think one of the saddest things is to say young and old men <laughs> walking around with pants nowadays it ain't even on the half of the butt, it's below the butt. <laughs> and when they have to run, they have to gird up the me. <laughs> they have to try to gather it up, put it together, and hold it as they hop along. <laughs> That's where we get our phrase, gird up your loins. Arrange your clothing so that you can move quickly without being hindered. The Roman soldier would also typically wear what would be, in essence, a short skirt. It often also had leather pleats for additional protection. This belt would secure the tunic in place as well as hold the outer skirt in place and provide a place where he could shield his sword. It was a very essential piece of equipment that tied everything together. But notice how Paul refers to this belt as being a belt of truth. 
Why is that important for us to believe her? Because it is truth that ties everything together for us. Amen. Securing us and giving us the ability to move quickly and decisively through our world today. It is truth that holds the, the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It is truth that is foundational to the Christian. And I find that when we are attacked by the devil, or one of his many cohorts, that attack is almost always against the truth of God. It was Jesus who said in John 8, 31 and 32, John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, to those Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, what would the truth make them free from? What does the truth make us free from? It certainly it is nothing to do with how we feel or, or consequences. It has to do with that which puts us in bondage. It frees us from sin. It frees us from Satan, our adversary. It frees us from having a self-centered life. It frees us from a life that's lived in and for solely this present world. It's going to end in tragedy for all eternity and separated from God. I'm always encouraged when I meet someone seeking the truth, no matter how far away they may be from, from their walk with the Lord. But I'm always interested when someone asks a question regarding truth. Why? Because all truth will eventually lead to Jesus Christ. Amen. All truth will eventually lead to Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Everyone who is an actual truth seeker will find Jesus Christ at the end of their quest. They will come to agreement with the scriptures eventually. But Jesus declared the word of God to be truth, John 17 and 17. Now if you contrast this with what Jesus said in John 8 and 44 about the devil, he said that the devil was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Jesus said about the devil, whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. That's right. He speaks from his own nature. So he's saying that the nature of the devil is a liar. For he is a liar. And then he goes on to say, the devil is the father of lies. And we have to understand, saints, that some of Satan's lies are in direct opposition to what God has declared and so some of his lies are easy for us to spot as we know God's word other lies in the devil are kind of subtle with some mimicking the truth so closely that they are difficult for us to discern Satan can twist scripture themselves and put people on a path almost parallel to biblical truth. But since it's, it is not biblical truth, it is a road that will eventually lead to hell. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and 14 that the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And few are those who find it. Please understand this, that the goal of Satan is to absurd God's position. The goal of Satan is to replace God as being supreme ruler of the universe. And the ramification of this to the people is that he will try to keep the unsaved from coming to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, and Satan will try to keep the Christian from being effective in their life, in their walk with the Lord, and keep us from living for Christ. And Satan will use any means necessary, any means available to him to accomplish these goals once again. But his goal for the unsaved is to keep them from any knowledge of what Jesus Christ has done for them. Mm -hmm. So that they will remain in sin and remain 
in bondage and they will not seek the forgiveness of their sins. And for us, the believer, he wants to make us ineffective in our walk. And he wants to keep us from having a living relationship with God through Christ. And he will use any available means to accomplish these goals. And his lies are a major means. Satan's lies are a major means. He uses lies to keep mankind from salvation. In John 14 and 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. And Satan has many different tactics and falsehood and distortions to use against that truth. He has many ways to stop individuals from hearing the truth regarding Jesus so that they won't come to the Father. You can't get to the Father unless you come through Jesus. Some people fall for his direct contradictions of what Jesus says. And so Satan uses what we call atheism which is the disbelief or lack of belief in the existence of God or gods. And then there is a more tactful cousin of atheism called agnosticism, which is the belief that the existence of God is there and the supernatural, but it is unavailable for us to know. He uses these tactics to claim that God is a myth and that Jesus was just merely a man. He would use the philosophy of evolution to deny that creation proclaims God's glory and that creation is an illustration of God's handiwork. And instead, it just becomes the happenstance of a natural process over millions of chances or millions of years. Now, the devil has many other tactics, but the most common tactics he used in our day and to prevent individuals from encountering the truth of Jesus Christ is what we call false religions and cults. False religions deny that Jesus is the way, and false religions proclaim themselves to be the way to be reconciled with God or whatever supernatural force or forces they believe in. Or they may claim that Jesus is only a way instead of being the way. For they all claim that all roads, including their own road, lead to heaven. This again is a lie and it's becoming increasingly popular in our society. Which our modern evangelical church espouses what I call tolerance and acceptance as a greater value or greater virtue for the church that truth for all should be tolerated or accepted. If these are not effective, then Satan can cause one to agree that Jesus is the only way and then turn around and reinterpret who Jesus is. This is characteristic of the cults of the day. And why I believe the Apostle John wrote in 1 John 4 and verses 1, 2, and 3. He warned us in 1 John 4 verses 1, 2, and 3. Beloved, please do not believe every spirit. Beloved, 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 you need to faith. Beloved, beloved, please do not believe every Believe every, every spirit. But test, test the spirits to see whether they are from God. We just about believe everybody who say they are Christian. And there are so many being, being mixed up and confused. Every spirit that come on TV, apostle, archbishop, more women, more women up in prominent positions and they got a word, apostolic word, a word here, a word there. We're looking for the outrageous, the strange. The word of God said, please test every spirit and see if these spirits come from God. Why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world 
by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard that is coming, and now it is already in the world. You see, we live in a day where religious tolerance is politically and socially correct. But I personally have never been concerned about being politically correct. And I care little about being socially correct if that means being quiet about the truth. We name this church Unity of Faith Christian Church in part because we are called to come into the unity of faith as Paul preached to us in Ephesians 4 and 13. We are admonished to grow in God's grace, 2 Peter 2 and 18. We are called to stand firm in God's grace, 1 Peter 5 and 12. And we are called to be gracious to one another in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Amen. Our intent here as a church is to do those very things. However, it is not gracious to withhold the truth and substitute the truth for a lie. This church must teach that Jesus Christ as he is presented in scripture that he is not simply a way but he is the way that Jesus Christ is not a truth but that he is the truth that Jesus Christ is not a life but that he is the life and that no man, no woman, no child no baby will ever see God the Father except through him. Amen. Amen. Now we may tolerate other religions in the sense that we are not seeking to do away with people, but we do seek to annihilate their religions by converting them to the truth. We tell everybody the truth. Yes, we believe that ours is the only way. Yes, we're dogmatic about it. We believe that Jesus Christ is the only way. We're the only one entertained. Right, right, right. Yes. Right, right, right. <clears throat> we don't accept non-biblical faith or, perver or, or, or perversions of the biblical faith as valid. They are based on the lies of the devil and they are roads that lead to hell. Which many, which billions have already traveled on and are yet traveling. Certainly we need to be civil, for we are to be gracious, and grace speaks, grace must speak the truth in love. Let us also make sure that we are not deceived about the reality of the situation, and that the destination of those following these false religions and cults is hell about. Satan's lies to mankind, if you recall, started in the Garden of Eden, when he deceived Eve into sin. We know how he did it. He did it through lies. His first statement questioned what God had commanded. Oh, oh I wish you were following. His first statement questioned what God had commanded. Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Now, he did correct him here. He corrected the, she corrected the serpent that God had only restricted them from the fruit of one tree. But then Satan responded directly, and then he contradicted what God has said about the consequences. He simply said, you will not surely die. And then Satan slandered God's character by accusing him of holding out on Eve. When he said, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He questioned God's word. He contradicted God's word. He slandered against God's character. All of this was a part of his lies that, that ultimately went against the character and the nature of God. All of Satan's lies are against the character of God. He's trying to belittle God in the eyes of man. It is God that the devil is seeking to observe. 
and his lies to us seek to turn us away from the Lord in the same way that he deceived Eve. And so the rest of my message, leaving your outline, as you can see, and several weeks to come, I want to expose some of the major lies that he, that he shows us and the ramification of these lies. In doing so, I hope that you will see the importance of having on this belt of truth. You don't mind taking this journey with me, do you? First of all, I'm going to talk about the lies against God's existence. This is Satan's most bold, this is the boldest lie that Satan tells, that God does not exist. Atheism states this directly, while agnosticism denies all evidence so that they can claim that they do not know. The truth is that both the atheist and the agnostic know, but they deny what they know. Mm -hmm. It is in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 20, one of the most direct passages to the atheist and the agnostic. The word of God reads, for the wrath of God is revealed. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Why? Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So that they are simply without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their futile and foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. The agnostic is just a little bit more tactful than the atheist, but both of them are willfully ignorant. They willfully choose to be ignorant. It's hard to believe that anyone would fall for such a lie with all of the evidence of creation shouting God's truth. Amen. And yet every philosophy that has been that has been birthed from this lie, whether it's communism or whether it's scientism, have ensnared many individuals. This lie has many ramifications because once the idea of a creator God who will hold you accountable for your action has been removed, the door is open to any and every kind of evil. Man becomes just the highest form of animal life. Men then can continue to be inhumane to one another. We see the atrocities that have been committed under atheistic communism since 1917. We can hardly recount the millions upon millions of people that have been slaughtered under atheistic communism. And the countless more who have suffered and those who continue to suffer under such governments. The blood of Christian martyrs still flow in places like China and North Korea and other communist lands mixed with the cries of anguish from our persecuted brethren that are there on the battlefield right now. And then we can leave out scientific atheism. It has paved the way for the worst form of racism imaginable that includes the Holocaust. I realize that most of those who believe in evolution deny this by claiming that Darwin did not and would not have condoned such a thing, much less advocate such a thing as the Holocaust. However, ideas have consequences. And Darwin's book and his idea did not promote racism. But the title of the book, the original book, the title has been changed, it was changed in 1872, but the original title of the book was On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favorite Races in the Struggle for Life. 
That was the title of the original book, and it was changed in 1872. He talked about racial genocide as a natural conclusion to those ideas. And from that, many dictators have governed their countries, including Hitler. Atheistic philosophies have destroyed the moral foundations even of our Western society and has laid the foundation for an attitude toward materialism that's now found greatly in these United States and in much of the church. Western Europe has been thoroughly synchronized with the leading of America. Psalms 14 and 1 and Psalms 53 and 1 both states this very clear. It is the fool who has said in his heart, there is no God. Amen. When you meet people who are caught in this lie, remember that they have willingly rejected the truth that God has placed in their heart at their birth. Don't expect them to believe you or even give you a fair hearing. The only thing we can do is pray. And you have the opportunity to confront them head on with this truth. If you are prepared and they are willing to actually listen. Challenge them. Challenge them on the premise and the assumptions of their belief. What is the source of their authority? Why is that an authority for them? Are they honest enough to put their source of information through the same rigorous challenge that they put my Bible through? Ask them if they or anyone they know have any record of someone being present when the world was formed. The same question that God had to ask Job. If not then, were they there firsthand? Were they there? Did they have a first-hand witness? Do they have any thoughts about the origin or the basis of assumptions and the interference that they have about the origin of this universe? When they ask you, do you have, you respond by saying, yes, I have. It's called Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's our claim. That's God's claim. Amen. In order to assert that there is one God, you have to have all knowledge. If you say that there is no God, then that means you have to have all knowledge. And since no atheists or all of them combined have all knowledge, their claim is false. Their pride brings them to an invalid, absolute statement that they can never prove. If they were honest, they would have to say that they have not recognized God in their own experience and that they do not know if he exists outside of their experience. The honest atheist would have to abandon his position and become an agnostic, which is someone who says that they do not know if God exists. He can't be known. Now, there are two kinds of agnostics. There are two kinds of agnostics. Those who do not know because they are still searching and have not found God yet, and there are those who claim that they cannot know, and because they cannot know, they simply do not search. The former, the last one that I just mentioned, are what is termed as humble and honest agnostics, while the first one in reality is termed as being arrogant and stubborn as the atheist although they believe themselves to be intellectually honest and humble. Those that are truly looking for God will find Him. Amen. If they're truly looking for Him, they want to find Him. Amen. Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20 tells us that Amen. God has made Himself evident to all men. And God says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Amen. Hebrews 11 and 6, As he who comes to God must believe that He is, Amen. that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. The honest agnostic again, he acknowledges that he do not know God, but they also have knowledge that he could not exist. 
And in that acknowledgement, there is not only the basis for them searching for God, but also the intellectual necessity to do so, because only the fool would agree that God does not exist, and then turn around and fail to search for him. Such a fool would fall into our next category that I call the dishonest agnostic who does not know God and will simply not search for him. Now that may be due to their arrogance or their laziness or even their fear. But any of those are innately selfish to the individual. The arrogant agnostic is open to the possibility that God exists, but they do not believe such a search is worth their time and effort. And then there is that lazy agnostic the lazy agnostic just does not want to put any energy into such a search. Both the lazy agnostic as well as the arrogant agnostic would rather gamble on the possibility that there is no God than to give up anything they are currently doing in order to search and just in case they might be wrong. Mm -hmm. And then there is the fearful agnostic. Now the fearful agnostic does not search for God for the same reason that a thief will not search for a policeman. <laughs> they don't want to face the demands that God would make on their life if by some chance they found him. By claiming ignorance, they think that they can avoid God and continue living as they desire in their own private world. But God's wrath cannot be avoided by denying or ignoring God. Yeah. God's wrath already revealed against their unrighteousness according to Romans 1 and 18 and one day they're going to have to face the reality of God they're going to have to face the reality of the God that created them Satan tries a variation of this in the 20th century with some liberal theologians if you remember around the late 60s and the early 70s when there was a proclaim in the Americas that God was dead. I remember graduating from high school, wrestling with this premise that God was dead. Now the law never, never really gathered enough strength. It never made an impact upon a larger society because the innate foolishness of the statement did not stick with the majority of people. This was a lie against God's eternality which he is by definition self-revealed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, from everlasting to everlasting. And those that will not acknowledge God do not need this lie, and those that do acknowledge God reject the idea that he could be dead. Well then, what evidence do the natural man have for theism. The first evidence of God's existence, we've been studying on our Wednesday night study his attributes, and his plan for mankind from God are given to us in Scripture. Scripture itself gives us evidence of God's existence. We have the testimony of people through the ages that God exists, their accounts of what he has done for them and through the course of history. The Bible is still true regardless of whether people, mm -hmm. atheists, Gnostics, you, lukewarm, liberals, whether you believe it or not, the Bible is still true. Amen. Truth is not determined by whether it's popular. Mm -hmm. right. Truth is true because it's actual reality. God knew that man would not readily accept the witness of his prophets. So from the very beginning, he was also left, he left other evidence and other reasons for us to believe that he exists. Creation itself declares that God exists, as we already pointed out. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and 20, that God has made himself evident. Amen. 
For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without, without excuse. The expanse of this great universe demonstrates God's vastness and God's power. It was David who said in Psalm 19, verse 1 and 2, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, yes. and their expanse is declaring the work of God's hand. Day to day, forth forth speech, and night to night reveals God's knowledge. Amen. The provisions of all of our basic needs of life demonstrates God's goodness and kindness. Church, dare not you leave thinking in any way, shape, form, or fashion to any degree or percentage that what we have is not because of the goodness of our God. Amen. Because God is good and God is kind. Yes. Yes. We have what we have. Thank you. So Peter chapter 3 warns that the destruction of the earth by the flood the first time is a warning that God will also judge the future. Though this time is going to be by fire. Mm -hmm. Those that do not recognize these things fail because they willingly suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They are markers that ignore the evidence. Now, I, 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 I'm going to close with some of the atheists and agnostics arguments that they try, they want to say that there is a God, especially the agnostic, but we just can't know it. These are four of the major arguments, and we call these extra-biblical reasons used by theists to believe in a God, but not our God. Help me out with these words, Deborah, so I can flow through these. All right? Cosmological argument, number one. The cosmological argument. The cosmological argument is, is the rule of cause and effect. Whenever there is an effect, there must be something that caused it. None of us have ever had any experience that did not have some cause. When Newton observed the apple fall from the tree, it was the rule of cause and effect that led him to his scientific description of what we now know as gravity. He did not actually discover it since humans have been aware of gravity since the first time a person failed and skipped their knees. Cosmological argument follows this line of logic. A, something exists, which is the world. B, nothing cannot produce something. So it has to be C, something or someone must have caused it. But they simply say, we cannot know it. And you don't have none of this information on your outline. I didn't give y'all all of my notes. <laughs> you don't have all of my notes there. So let me go over that again. That argument is letter A. Something has to exist, which is the world. B. Nothing can produce something. And C. Something or someone then must have caused it. Then there is the psychological argument. The telecological argument. What is this argument? This argument is a more precise argument than the cosmological argument. It simply says a design must require a designer. The universe as it is displayed is magnificent design, therefore there must be a designer, namely God. You look at the complexity of the universe, it demands an extremely intelligent designer. This is how it flows. A, there is a design, there is an order that implies a designer. Then there's B, we see design, so it must equal to C, there must be a designer. Mm -hmm. The third argument, the anthropological argument. Anthropological argument. We don't have them. Another evidence of what is referred to as the anthropological argument deals with man's personality, man's will, man's mind, man's emotion, man's moral nature must reflect a character 
such as God who is himself personal and moral just as he is personal and moral. That argument simply says creation reflects the creator. And then there's the last moral argument. The final evidence is moral argument. This is the idea that there must be a universal source for the fact that all men have a sense of moral obligation. While there is a variation to some degree from man to man, all men have a sense of what's right and what's wrong, this argument says, with an obligation then to do what's right and to refrain from what's wrong. And failure to do so results in man feeling guilty and liable for punishment. This evidence that there must be a law and a lawgiver, and his name must be God. Some people want to use the existence of evil as proof that there is a God and he has to be a good God. The truth is that they could not know what is evil if there was not a corresponding and contrasting understanding of good. Amen. In addition, where could good come from if there is not a God who defines it? The existence of evil does not negate the existence of good, especially a good God. Amen. But rather, it demands that a good God will have to punish that which is evil. Amen. While no argument from creation or the nature of man would ever prove God does not exist, to someone who simply just refuses to believe, they do show what it is reasonable for us to believe that there is a God who is a spirit and is infinite and is eternal in his entire being. He's perfect. He's unchangeable in his attributes and in whom all things have their source, their support, and their end. We proclaim the truth to the atheists. We proclaim the truth to the agnostics. We proclaim the truth to everyone. But you cannot argue someone into believing. That's right. Well, ultimately, as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, belief in the true God is spiritual in nature. I simply close by asking the question, have you fallen for Satan's lies against God's existence? Do you entertain conversation? Do you read material that question the existence of God? That includes materials come from atheists, Gnostics, those who claim to believe in God, but he's a God that cannot be known. We must come to the realization that our God is an eternal God. He's an infinite God. He has created us. He can be known. He wishes to be known. And he has made himself to be known to us through the pages of scripture, to his creation, to us being created into new creations. From him changing our hate to love. For him giving us peace of mind. He is our source. Our support. And our end is to know him. And to be changed into the image of his son. This God that we serve knows everything about us. One day you and I we live in hope that we will stand before him. Not as the judge over the wrath or giving out the wrath for our sin, but as our Heavenly Father who will welcome us into His bosom, who will welcome us into us, into His eternal home. Yeah. I hope today you know where your end will be. Where God teaches us that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. All others will be condemned for their failure to obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will be judged and cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. I implore you, seek him. Find him in the pages of scripture. Don't entertain thoughts, materials, entertainment that will cause doubt upon the existence of our God. If you're not rooted and grounded 
in the existence of our God. Seek that material. Ask for help. Ask those who will help you become secure in your understanding. Not that you just have notes or an outline from a lesson that your pastor has given you, but that you have studied and incorporated this information within you. So if no one else, you can give your own self a reason for your hope. Yes. Yes. You may not have to give nobody else an answer for why you're saved, but sometimes you will have to look in the mirror and remind your own self, this is why I'm a believer. Yes. Listen up, self. I'm not going to go down that road of self-doubt. I'm not going to go down that road of self-pity because this is who I am in Christ. This is what God has done for us. We will have to encourage ourselves and pick your own self up. Amen. But you can't do that if nothing is rooted around you. Amen. Amen. You got to tell yourself, hold up, I'll be back. I got to go search and find the out. I know it was back in 2015 something. Study the word. Right, right. We are privileged here to be exposed to the truth. We experience, we are privileged to be exposed to teachings in the Word of God. Please take every advantage, every advantage. I know you have other things going on in your life. I know you do. But saints, I want to admonish you as your pastor. Nothing is important, more important than the eternity of your soul. Amen. Amen. Don't take that lightly. Amen. Give God the priority. Seek to know him. If you can't make it during the week in Bible study, get our outline. Study the word of God. Get the Bible on tape. Get some tapes. Play them in your car, your truck, wherever you may be. And doctrinate yourself in the doctrines of God. Be rooted and grounded in truth. Seek him. Serve him as you should. According to Romans chapter 12, it's the reasonable thing that we can do. Yes given all the mercies that God has bestowed upon yes. us. There is in this outline questions regarding how to explain this to our children. My wife will tell you all day yesterday and I was up at 3.38 this morning finishing this. I wanted to provide a different kind of outline because I wanted to take stuff home that we can talk over with our children and there may be somebody who wants to go into a deeper understanding of this. Some of you may not just be satisfied with what you've got today so that there are a page of questions that will help you in your search in the existence of God. Don't fall for his lies. Let's pray.